Good afternoon. Welcome those of you who are here in uh, physical presence, uh, as well as those online, uh, to a panel discussion on careers in humanitarian health. This, uh, as many of you know, not all, is part of a seminar in humanitarian health that I co-instruct with Paul Spiegel, who is not here. Um, I gather he's in Stockholm or maybe Jordan, but simply uh, maybe parts unknown. But he sends his greetings uh, and his regrets um, that he could not attend. So I'll be moderating kind of in his stead. I'll be introducing all of the speakers um, one by one before they speak, and then each will come in turn, speak here at the podium for about 10 to 12 minutes. Uh, some have slides, I gather, some do not. Uh, we'll work that out as we go along, and then I'm going to ask them to take their places on the, at the panel table. Uh, and after all four have finished speaking, um, we will have time, I hope, around 20 minutes or so for Q&A about the issue of career um, options and challenges in, in humanitarian health. The format is really quite informal. Um, I have asked them to think about three questions. What has led you into a career in humanitarian health? How did you get into this gig? Um, what are its opportunities and challenges? And what advice would you give to people who are trying to get involved in this work? Some come here from Hopkins, some represent other institutions, but we want to make sure that they know and you all know and those listening online uh, that this is not an on-the-record discussion and that their comments are made in a personal capacity, not on behalf of any institutions. So I would ask you all to respect that. When we get to the Q&A session, because we're being taped, um, please go to one of the microphones on the left or right-hand sides of, of Sheldon Hall. Um, I have to note, it's not entirely intentional, but a happy coincidence It's all our speakers are female. Um, I go back, uh, date myself a little bit uh, to a time when that was not such a common event. And I had the privilege of working with people like Julia Taft, uh, who headed the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance in the 80s, uh, Sadako Ogata, who headed the UN High Commissioner for Refugees in the 90s. Um, it was kind of a rare event to see women in leadership positions in humanitarian health, and I think that's more and more common. Hopefully it becomes almost an unremarkable thing. Uh, perhaps that someday we'll say, oh, look, there's a male who's actually doing work in humanitarian health. Um, but it is an important uh, moment, I would suppose, and if you feel you wish to comment on that, uh, what it means to be a woman in the, the uh, humanitarian health field, please feel free to comment. It's also not entirely a coincidence. Um, but sort of one, that all of them are graduates of the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health with either MPHs or and or PhDs, and one is a current student. We'll talk more about uh, that later. So there is life after this um, program and productive careers to be had. Um, so without further ado, our first speaker will be Nora Hellman. She has a BA in Cultural Anthropology and a BS in Nursing. She initially worked as an RN in critical care and emergency departments in the US, started working in humanitarian emergencies in the aftermath of the Haiti earthquake in 2010, and since then has worked for NGOs including International Medical Corps and Save the Children as part of their emergency health teams. She's worked in the aftermath of natural disasters in Haiti and the Philippines, responded to disease outbreaks including cholera, Ebola, and yellow fever, and worked to deliver health care during conflicts in South Sudan. Gaza and Syria, and she completed her MPH just recently in 2017. Um, the next speaker after Nora will be Janine Kassen, who is the Senior Policy Advocacy Officer for Women's Protection and Empowerment at the International Rescue Committee, IRC. Prior to joining uh, IRC, she held senior position, policy positions within the U.S. government and the nonprofit sector including serving as Director of Public Policy for Advocates for Youth. She's worked as a Peace Corps volunteer in Mauritania, West Africa, and as a policy consultant advisor, trainer for youth activists in the Global South. She holds a JD in International Human Rights Law from University of Cincinnati and an MPH from Johns Hopkins with certificates in Health and Human Rights and Maternal and Child Health. Third, uh, Thalia Christie joined CDC in 1997 as a public health prevention service fellow focusing on lymphatic filariasis uh, from 2001 to 2005. She was seconded to WHO, worked on polio eradication in Somalia and South Sudan, 
was then detailed in uh, 2006, the American Red Cross to lead the measles initiative, became deputy for global health in Washington in 2012, and is deputy director for the Center of Global Health. During this time, she has deployed nine times uh, to lead CDC's Ebola response team in Liberia and Sierra Leone. She has a number of awards uh, for that and other service, including the Watsonian Public Health Advisor of the Year, Secretary's Award for Distinguished Service, and American Red Cross Spirit of Excellence. She has a master's from Columbia. Uh, and in what she describes, I hope I'm not outing you, as a post-Ebola midlife crisis, <laughs> is doing a DRPH. Uh, here at Johns Hopkins, uh, I did my PhD as a so-called mature student, so um, uh, that's a good choice. Uh, you'll get through it. And last but not least, uh, Melissa Oprisco is health team leader and senior WASH advisor for USAID's Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance, OFDA. Uh, she's been a WASH advisor for six years, has over 20 years of experience in environmental health, both internationally within the U.S., including disaster response research and environmental regulation. And she's responded to acute and slow onset disasters, as well as complex emergencies in more than 20 countries. Um, she holds a doctorate in environmental health sciences and an MPH from Johns Hopkins Bloomberg. So welcome to all of you. Uh, and I will turn the microphone and PowerPoint slides over to Nora. Uh, and after that, uh, I think if you can just come up one at a time without my sort of jumping back in to reintroduce you. So, Nora Hellman. Thanks. Thanks for the introduction, Court. How is everybody? Very humbling to be here um, with all these ladies today. So, thank you. This is my very um, original introductory slide. Um, so, um, Court asked us to think about three things, um, how we got started, share a little bit about um, our work, and then any advice that we may have for you. So um, for me, humanitarian health was a very natural progression, um, although I definitely took the long road. Um, I, as Court kind of already summarized, I did my undergrad in anthropology. I took a course in medical anthropology and that kind of sparked um, an interest in me that I didn't quite know what to do with yet. Um, so I graduated and I was ready to go save the world. Um, and I realized, oh, I don't have a skill. So um, I went to nursing school um, with the intention of doing some kind of global health work um, and was always drawn to vulnerable populations and advocating for those vulnerable populations. Um, and then I started to do my MPH um, after deploying as a nurse to several emergency responses. Um, and yeah, so I think I'm just going to walk through a couple um, of my deployments and experiences overseas. Um, yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions along the way. So my perspective is from an NGO perspective. Um, and then within that world, I've always been field-based as opposed to based in headquarters or an office. Um, I'm new faculty here at Hopkins. This is the first desk job I've ever had. It's a very big change. Um, and then within that, as far as responses, I've always been um, emerg on the emergency side of things as opposed to development. So those are just kind of some important distinctions as you guys start to think about what you're interested in. So I started off after the Haiti earthquake in 2010. Um, I volunteered for an NGO called International Medical Corps based in Washington, D.C. Um, I volunteered three times on three separate occasions for several weeks at a time um, before I finally got offered a job, so be persistent. Um, the cholera outbreak in Haiti was declared in October after the earthquake um, 10 months prior, and I was hired to run a cholera treatment center I didn't really know anything about cholera, but luckily it's very simple to treat and manage. So this was my first job in the humanitarian world, um, and definitely I was hooked. And for me, I was just on a contract basis with the NGO, and so they have like an external roster that they call upon when there's emergencies. So the next emergency I deployed to with them was in the Philippines, Typhoon Haiyan, in November of 2013. 
And it was after this period, and I spent about a month in the field, that I knew this is what I wanted to do, and I realized I needed an MPH to do it. So I came home, and I applied to Hopkins. And as I was filling out my application, um, I got an email, another email from IMC asking if I would go to South Sudan. So off I went. There was a civil war that's still ongoing, but started there in December of 2013. And I um, arrived in January and spent about three months there um, managing a health program. We delivered primary health care, maternal health care, in one of the camps for the internally displaced um, persons. Um, so at this point, I'd had kind of exposure to conflict, natural disasters, and disease outbreaks. Those are also kind of three other areas you guys can think about when you think about what you're interested in. For me, I'm a conflict person. I love it. Um, that's what I'm drawn to. So, um, so I came home from South Sudan, and I got a letter from Johns Hopkins that I got in. Um, so I started the MPH program part-time, and while I was going part-time, I spent about 50% of my time on campus here in Baltimore and 50% online, and worked um, in various responses throughout my, my academic uh, time here. So it was very interesting. Um, I was in Liberia, not nine times like Athalia, <laughs> but um, I was there from about October to February 2014, and this was a really interesting response. Um, I think it was one of the few responses where direct clinical care was what was needed. You know, oftentimes expats are needed in much more of a supportive educational role, um, but I was a nurse and a nurse manager at one of the Ebola treatment centers seen here. Um, and kept going to school. And then I joined um, Save the Children. They um, were newly establishing what they called the Emergency Health Unit. It was a really interesting model. Um, I spent two years um, as a member of one of their three teams that they have. Um, and we were a team of seven people that were deployed rapidly in any kind of emergency to provide surge support for healthcare. Um, so you can see the teams were made up. The roles are listed here. I was the nurse slash health program manager. The role kind of evolved a little bit um, as time went on. And we delivered one of three predefined modules. So a Save the Children country office could request us to come in and deliver primary health care in an emergency or mass vaccination um, or basically set up a call or a treatment center. Um, and it was really interesting. I was a full-time employee. I was deployed 50% of the time, and the other 50% of the time I got to spend at home, which for me is in Montana. So it was amazing, very sustainable way to be able to do this kind of work. Um, and sustainable for the organization as well. We were pre-funded, we had pre-stocks, um, and we all trained together, had uh, standard operating procedures. We knew what to do when we landed on the ground. So um, a really successful model that I thoroughly enjoyed being a part of. And when I was with them, I deployed several places. These were three of the longer deployments I had. Um, DRC for the yellow fever vaccination campaign, um, and then followed by Haiti hurricane response and South Sudan famine response uh, most recently. So I don't really have any advice, um, but I have some, which <laughs> I know why you guys all came, but I have some lessons. Um, I mean, I've definitely kind of taken this long wandering, what am I meant to do with my life type approach to getting here. Um, and I don't think these lessons will apply to all of you because you're already here in this room and it took me a long time to even realize what public health was. Um, I had a professor, a chemistry professor, in like my first year of nursing school. I went up to him and I was talking to him about like something he had said about malaria and epidemiology. And I was like, that was so interesting. And he was like, yeah, you don't want to be a nurse. You want to be in public health. And I was like, OK. But I had no idea what public health was. Um, so I just plowed along. And nursing um, treated me very well. But um, for me, in order, what I learned and what I wish I'd known a little bit earlier was have a skill and know what you can offer and advocate for yourself. Especially as nurses, I found a lot of times um, I have people come to me and ask me you know, how, how they get into this field and what to do. And I think sometimes for nurses, even in the US, people don't understand what nurses do. But um, if there are any nurses in the room or listening, we have an incredibly diverse skill set um, and can be very useful. So have a skill, advocate for yourself. Be persistent. I volunteered three times before I got a job. 
Um, I was I hassled the HR person constantly. Um, but know that your persistence pays off. Organizations want to invest in you. So if you can get your foot in the door and you do a good job, um, they'll call you again. And that's what happened for me. When you're deployed or when you're hired or when you're volunteering, be flexible and low maintenance. I think that is why I got called back, honestly. <clears throat> There's a million nurses that want to go volunteer in South Sudan. There's only a few that you can actually send out to the field for three months and you know aren't gonna freak out and are gonna be able to manage their security and their own health. Um, so don't show up in the middle of an Ebola outbreak and show up at the guest house and be like, do you guys have any towels? Like, don't do that. Be self-sufficient, low maintenance, and be flexible and it'll pay off. Um, and this is something I, you know, later on as I progressed, um, it becomes important as you figure out what your skill set is and what's important to you that you find an organization um, that matches that. Um, so, you know, are you a natural disaster person? Are you more into conflicts? Are you into advocacy? You need to be sure that you're aligned with an organization um, that is also, or maybe it's a technical area, you know, certain NGOs are much stronger in, in, in WASH or, um, primary health care or reproductive health. So just be thinking about those things and learn what different organizations are doing. And then this is what I'm still working on, seeking advice and mentorship so I can continue to figure out what I want to do with my life. Um, you will, I don't know if some of you probably heard Paul Wise talk a couple weeks ago, a couple months ago at this point here. Um, and I chatted with him after his talk, his seminar, and he said, um, because I'm still like trying to find my place here and you know, what do I want to do? What do I want to contribute to this field? And he said, um, just pay attention to what you react to. And that really stuck with me, that statement. Um, and I think that's important. So be persistent, ask people questions, find people that can be mentors and pay attention to what you react to because you do your best work when you're doing things you care about. Um, you know, as cheesy as that might sound. So that's all I have. Um, yeah, I'll be happy to answer questions afterwards. Okay. Let's see. Good afternoon, everyone. How is everyone? Good? Great. Um, so my name is Janine Carson, and as I was introduced, I work for the International Rescue Committee, and I do policy and advocacy. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how um, that looks, but first I want to show you um, what my career trajectory was. And I use that in quotes because this is messy. And much like Nora said, it took me a really long time to figure out where I needed to be and how to get there. And so I just wanted to outline a little bit. Um, as the, uh, the introductory marks mentioned, I have a background in international human rights law. And so I always knew that I wanted to do policy and advocacy on behalf of women's rights, particularly in the global south. Um, but I realized um, when I was in law school, I did um, an internship in Washington um, that was focused on domestic programs. And so when I passed the bar, the day after, I had no job. And I said, well, you know, DC is where I need to be. And so fortunately, my internship company um, asked me to come on board. And so you see, I have, I went from there to focusing on domestic programs, um, which obviously was not what I wanted to do, right? Um, and so I spent a few years there and realized, much like Nora, that, wow, the, the stuff that I want to do for my, my career, I really need to get an MPH. So I came to Hopkins and studied in the Population Family Reproductive Health Division. And as mentioned, I'm focused on maternal and child health and health and human rights. So great, that should get me the job I want, right? Well, not so fast. So um, I went back to that same organization doing domestic programs and did that for a few years, all the while trying to figure out and keep applying to jobs. And it became really apparent to me during that time that what I was lacking, so originally I thought I was lacking an MPH, which was true. But then I realized I was also lacking field experience. And so then I took a detour and went to the Peace Corps and spent two years abroad doing, um, working with a midwife in my community and working, because I already had an MPH, 
I was stationed with the Ministry of Health in um, one of their state offices. And so got really, really great experience doing vaccination campaigns, doing family planning counseling, working with a midwife, as I mentioned, um, really understanding a little bit about how US policy and UN policy and, and the frameworks that guide that and international human rights law, how they impact women's access to family planning and reproductive health. Um, so from there, I came back to the States, and um, because I wanted to do policy work, I applied to a bunch of organizations wanting to do US foreign policy around these issues. But I realized I had no policy chops. I had no skills in policy. So you see my next detour, and this also has a dotted line, is because it, I focused on domestic policy and advocacy, working on early childhood education, healthcare, um, again, birth control, family planning issues, but from a domestic lens. And I built up my skills. I learned how to write legislation. I learned how to uh, craft messages for policymakers. I learned how to lobby members of Congress. Um, but again, I wasn't doing the actual content I wanted to do. Um, but I built the skills and then made my, my way into US foreign policy and focusing on sexual and reproductive health and rights and particularly around gender-based violence. And, um, the first five years of that work, I was focused on development settings. Um, and then it's the last three and a half years that I've been focusing on humanitarian settings. So as, as you saw, when I came to Hopkins, I didn't study in humanitarian field at all. Um, but this is just to say, and then you see like the red dots, the red arrows here is if I had to do it all over again, my trajectory would look quite different. I would have gone straight to the MPH. I would have immediately gone to the field and then hopefully would have gotten where I am. But all this to say that this is messy and for 99% of us, your career trajectory will look something like a bit messy um, as, as Nora even alluded to in her wandering way to get here. But I think what's important to know is, and I'll come back to this in the advice section, is you know, it's okay to divert as long as you're learning something along the way. Um, and so for me, like I said, um, I diverted to domestic policy and advocacy because I was building skills that would then be translatable in the field that I actually wanted to do. But what I found is if you um, stay any, you know, if you stay too long in a particular field, it's really hard to transition out of that. Um, and so you need to make sure you don't get pigeonholed into a category. Because what I was finding was, you know, after two years, and I started looking after one year of each of these jobs, and it took a while to get where I needed to go. But after the second year and the third year, people it was really hard to have those interviews because people were saying, oh, you've done all domestic work. How are you making the leap to international? And um, so it, it's not to say that these are mistakes, but to learn as you're going through the process so that you can translate the skills that you're learning in any particular job. It's not a leap. It wasn't a leap in my mind. It was building skills and creating the building blocks to translate that into the next job. So that's sort of what this, um, this messy slide is meant to say. So I imagine probably most of you have heard of International Rescue Committee, um, but just to give you a little bit of the framework of the work we do, um, our mission is up there. We help people whose lives and livelihoods are shattered by conflict and disaster to survive, recover, and gain control of their future. And so we work with um, people who are forced to flee, so either internally displaced folks or folks who, are, um, who have fled their country to a neighboring country and are refugees, or even um, we have offices in the US where we resettle refugees. And then we also work with the host communities in which they're living and also those who remain behind. And the, the main areas of what define our success are these five outcomes that are here. So we're looking at um, making sure that we're improving health outcomes, safety, education, economic well-being, and power. And my work in policy and advocacy cuts across all of these because I focus on addressing violence against women and girls. And we know, if you can imagine here, we have a road and we have a woman, and she's trying to access health, safety, education, power, and economic well-being. But what we find is that all along the way, barriers are blocking her access to that. And these barriers are manifestations of gender-based violence. And the work that IRC does is to recognize and put in place programs and solutions to address those barriers, um, including healthcare, uh, mental health care, psychosocial counseling, case management, um, so that we can remove those barriers or reduce or mitigate them. The same for adolescent girls, which is a particular area that I also focus on. 
so that when we are putting in place the appropriate programs, um, women are able to access um, gender equality and move through life in a way that respects their dignity and their rights and their honor. So just a quick story about what I do. This is our comprehensive program. We focus on prevention, so engaging with men and boys to reduce violence against women and girls, engaging with community leaders, um, services. So if a woman or a girl is experiencing violence, putting, um, referring her to services, again, with our medical services, um, with case management, with counseling. We work on empowerment programs um, to ensure that women have livelihoods training, that they have access to cash, that they have decision-making power in their homes. Um, and then advocacy, which is the pillar that I work on. So I focus on advocacy at the community, national, and international levels. Um, and I work with our country teams, with our emergency teams, um, with our research team, um, and, and with um, others within IRC to translate messages that I can then take to policymakers. So I think it's great that our panel is made up of folks who kind of cross the, the broad diversity of the work here, and we have some government folks here. Um, so I take this information on our research and our programs and translate that into messages for members of the US government and United Nations to put in place policies and programs and funding that will support um, best practice and what we know the evidence to say. And, and for instance, um, we've just completed two um, multi-year research studies, one on um, the prevalence of gender-based violence in South Sudan that we did in partnership with George Washington University, and another that was an evaluation of a life skills program for adolescent girls in uh, humanitarian settings that was done in partnership with Columbia University. So taking that research and learning and disseminating it to policymakers, to practitioners, um, to the media and to the general public. Um, and, and where I find most of my value in the policy world and in my public health degree is um, in doing that translation, that messaging, and then also in leading coalitions in Washington, D.C. to set the agenda um, so that we can speak in one voice when we're all representing um, the needs of, of refugees and, and internally displaced folks to stakeholders that have power um, to make decisions around funding and the programs that, that they um, are benefiting from. So I'm going to go back here to advice because this is going to circle back to the original slide that I shared with you. And similar to Nora, um, and I imagine similar to, to the folks that will follow me, um, I have a couple of pieces that are um, we'll probably hear over and over again. The first one is advice that I actually got when I was trying to struggle to find myself in this world. Um, is really find somebody who has the job you want ask them out for coffee, for lunch, um, really sit down with them and ask them how they got where they are. So similar to what we're doing today, but do that on a personal level where you have the time to have a conversation um, back and forth and you can really ask those questions and ask for advice. And one thing that I think people don't do often enough is when they have these meetings, they walk away thinking, that's great, I just talked to this person. But I, what I always tell folks that I mentor is that you do not walk away from those meetings without asking for the names of three other people and also a commitment for that person to introduce you to those folks um, so that you can continue to broaden out your network and um, make folks aware that you're looking and what your interests are so that they think of you when they have openings in their respective organizations and agencies. The second big piece of advice here is, um, particularly for somebody like me who, um, you know, when I was sort of stuck in the domestic world and really wanted to get to the international world, um, it was really important to me to take advantage of online courses to stay current. So for, for many of you who are already studying exactly what you want to study, this may not be relevant now, but as you're going through your career trajectory, make sure that you're utilizing these resources. Um, the first one here, USAID's Global Health eLearning Portal, I will admit. Um, I spent about eight months and took all 72 courses that were on that website. Um, I think they've now expanded. There's more than 72 courses, but I felt like I should get a reward for taking 100% of the courses there. Um, even when they weren't necessarily related, I felt like they provided me with a broad background that was really helpful. Um, there's a website called Building a Better Response that's focused on humanitarian issues. I'm sure many of you have heard of that. And then, of course, keeping up to date with language. Um, the, the third one is um, similar to what Nora said around internships and mentorships. And like she said, 
Um, you know, being flexible in the location, being willing to go to a really insecure place um, that, you know, maybe you'll be more competitive there because the pool of candidates who are willing to go to that particular place is a lot smaller. Um, you know, being flexible in the organization, yes, find an organization whose mission you align with, but um, you're probably not going to get that job, your dream job, right out of your MPH degree or your DRPH or whatever degree you're, you're focusing on. So be flexible. Sometimes it's easier to get into smaller organizations, build up your chops, and then move to a, a more well-known organization or one that, that you've really just always desired to work with. And then, of course, the type of work. Sometimes you can't get the exact field you want, but if you can, again, make those connections and not stay too long that you get pigeonholed, but can build those skills, you can move into other places. The important thing is getting in the door, right? Um, and then across all of these is this in bold letters, if I could make them flash, I would, is you know, field experience and language skills. Those are going to be your two most critical aspects of getting the job that you want. And I think. One last thing that I'll share is, um, you know, just from the perspective of a woman, I think um, research shows that um, when, when women look at job applications, um, we really tend to only apply if we meet 100% of the requirements in a job in a posting, whereas men will do it if they get 60%. Right? So I think we are self-censoring ourselves from putting our best foot forward. I think obviously, if there's a requirement you have a PhD and you don't have a PhD, don't waste your time, don't waste their time. But I think we, we often take ourselves out of the candidacy by not thinking, there's a lot of stuff we can learn along the way once we're in a job. And I think we need to do right by ourselves to make sure that we're reaching for those stretch opportunities and being realistic. Um, again, you're not gonna get your dream job right out of your degree program, but um, you know it doesn't hurt to try for things when you have um, not a full 100% of the, the requirements. So that's where I'll stand. Um, I'll leave it there. Um, and again, glad to take questions at the end. So thank you. Oh, sorry, here's um, a slide on ways to reach me and um, IRC. We have our own um, IRC's general website, but we also have a dedicated microsite that focuses on gender-based violence or violence against women and girls. It has a lot of our resources. Um, I'm a big fan of podcasts. We have a women's protection and empowerment podcast. So again, this would be something for the online learning for you. There are 15-minute sessions to learn about research, to learn about best practice, to learn about, um, I did one on International Women's Day around sort of the political consequences of what's happening in Washington and how that may impact women and girls. Um, and of course, we have Twitter and Instagram as well. So thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Athalia Christie. Um, thanks so much for coming today. I know this is a really tough time of the term. I, for one, am really nervous about passing EPI 774 next week, so I appreciate that all of you took the time to come here in person. I, I know it wasn't easy. Um, I, as Court mentioned, have spent my career at CDC and wanted to begin um, by just talking a little bit about CDC and our role in global health. Uh, CDC began as a malaria control agency, and our first work was in the uh, overseas was in the 1950s on cholera outbreaks and smallpox outbreaks. Um, and then obviously that continued um, to what the, the outbreaks you all are probably much more familiar with, SARS and Ebola and Zika, and the work that we're doing today. CDC's global health mission reads to protect and improve health globally through science, policy, partnership, and evidence-based public health action. And I mention that specifically to say that it does go beyond science, and if it doesn't end in action, then we shouldn't be doing it in the first place. Uh, CDC provides global health expertise in a number of areas, whether it's surveillance, operational research, or laboratory strengthening, and we do this at the request of ministries of health who are our main partners overseas. And we do it in a number of countries. The countries here in dark blue, there are over 60 um, where we have permanent CDC offices, and then additional countries where we have ongoing technical collaborations. CDC offices are often embedded in the Ministry of Health, although we serve um, at the pleasure of the ambassador and are under chief of mission authority overseas. We also second 
uh, dozens of staff to UN agencies and other partners to work directly for them. Um, so where to start when you are looking for a job? I'm asked quite a lot um, after class here about how people get their start at CDC. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody had access to what's um, actually quite an extensive website of CDC fellowships and wanted to make the point that it is more than just EIS. Um, so it's not only EPI. We have fellowships in evaluation and informatics, in preventative medicine, everything that you see here. Um, and there's a number of open applications, so if you have a little time before exams, you can throw some in. Uh, I thought a lot when, um, during the Ebola response about how every job I had had for the previous 17 years really helped prepare me um, for, for that position, whether it was um, working with the New York City TB department, where I learned a lot of risk communication skills, or working um, in South Sudan, where I learned the global health architecture of international response during an emergency, um, or when I was in Somalia, where I learned the very important skill of being able to pinch large insects between my pant legs so that I didn't have to move until my part of the meeting uh, was over and I was able to give my update. And those skills were all essential um, in Ebola and more. Um, we're going to talk about a lot of serious things today, uh, the field experience, um, how you need language skills, um, but I also wanted to mention uh, keeping a sense of humor um, and the flexibility that Nora mentioned earlier. Um, whether it was the staff who took the time to put a sign on his tent that says uh, Centers for Disease Control, uh, GNCSU Liberia office, um, or, <laughs> or the staff evaluation I received um, when I arrived back at my apartment um, getting ready to do a, a call with Dr. Frieden to give him the daily update on Ebola, and I had conveniently scheduled the call for 12.30 uh, a.m., and uh, my staff wanted to know how they felt about that and left me the sign that says, if you are Athalia, please go away. Uh, so keeping your sense of humor um, will not only keep you sane if you're working in humanitarian emergencies, but it will certainly um, keep people calling you to come back. Um, those staff really are the ones that I would deploy with again and again, because not only were they extraordinarily good at their jobs, but they made me laugh. Um, I wanted to say just a couple other things in addition to what's been mentioned. Um, I can't stress enough how important field experience is. Get overseas if you're interested in global health and stay there as long as you can. Um, there's, there's nothing better to prepare you. Um, but I also think it's really important to think about what your added value will be. You'll graduate from Johns Hopkins and you'll have an MPH or a doctorate um, in epidemiology or whatever your concentration is, and honestly, you will be one of hundreds. So what is it that you can do with that? Are you the person who can put those epi skills into context um, of our foreign policy goals uh, and convince a senator why your work is important? Are you the person who has enough communication skills to convince a community member to give you a semen sample that moment? Um, whatever it is, whatever that added value skills are, it's worth taking some time to think about it because the science and the epi and being able to calculate an odds ratio are not enough. Um, I'm happy to talk about that more um, in the panel, but I think I'm out of time, so I'll end it there. Well, I guess I'll say, sorry, I'll say one other thing. When Court um, mentioned that we're an all, female panel. Um, the first time I deployed for Ebola, people said, oh, that's, you know, you're so brave. You're doing a great thing. Wow, I, I can't imagine doing that. And the second time I deployed, they said, really? You're deploying again? How old are your kids? And the third time I deployed, they said, don't you think your family should be your first priority? It frustrated me, to put it politely. <laughs> um, but my other advice would be partner well. Because my husband's response was, this is your war. You have trained for this your entire life. We will see you when you get back. So it's just another thing to think about and add to your list. Thank you. So I don't have slides. I'll just be talking. Um, but I'm thrilled to be here because this is a place that has given me tremendous opportunities and really turned the tide for me for shifting into international work. Um, 
It's lovely to be on the panel with these uh, wonderful women. And the last time I saw Athalia, you may not remember me, but it was in the dart room in Liberia, dashing in for a disaster assistance response team call back to DC to try to give the update. And it was kind of crazy times and trying to figure out how to, how to get to the curve or ahead of the curve. Um, so I'll start with a little bit of the the same theme that's been coming up. Um, it's not a straight line to getting into humanitarian assistance, but it's very much about collaborative work and being willing to jump in where you need to fill in your skills, learning on the job, and being very flexible, but it really is very much teamwork. Um, I started in environmental health. I graduated with an undergrad in biology, not quite sure what I wanted to do, but I knew I didn't want to be in a lab at that point. I wanted to figure out how to get outside. I really loved the environment. Um, so I landed in the Maryland Department of the Environment located in Frederick County as an environmental health sanitarian. And how many of you know what a sanitarian is? <laughs> yeah, so um, it is the basic frontline environmental health worker doing water quality sampling, uh, laying out what a septic field looks like, air quality. It really is kind of the basic public health um, worker, but we don't hear about them anymore. It's now kind of couched more in regulation. Um, it's all that stuff that needs to be taken care of that we assume that's being taken care of, um, but nobody talks about it as much in public health, but it's basic frontline public health. Uh, so I worked in that, this was back in the late 80s, and when I started, I was the first woman professional in my office, and it was the Office of Water Quality, and my boss the first day said, I don't know how to deal with a woman in this position. You know, we'll see how this goes. And I was like, well, all right. Um, it worked out fine. We, we worked very well together, but I had to prove my place, and I had to make sure uh, it was comfortable for more women to come in after me, which luckily it was. But after that, and this is again showing my age, um, I was there for a number of years and then I left to stay home with my kids. Um, so I was out of the career path for um, about 10 years. During that time, I was working on all sorts of community projects. Um, I was involved in all the PTA stuff. All those skills do come to your aid. All of that coordination, all of that outreach, all of that understanding what it takes for community to build is important in this country, it's important overseas, and it continues to be the foundation of how I approach public health. Um, but I knew at the end of that that I did want to get back into my career and how in the world to do that. And that led me to Hopkins. Um, part-time, trying to figure out how to get my skills back, how to understand what the world of public health was. Uh, I come from a background where my, parent, my mother grew up on a medical mission in China, and that very much influenced my interest in international health. Um, my husband's parents were refugees after World War II. Their experiences certainly fed into my interest in how to um, support the most vulnerable in the world. And when I came to Hopkins, and they were going around kind of the first day, excited to be here, and everyone's kind of talking about what their backgrounds are, and there were a number of physicians, there were a number of uh, nurses, there were some veterinarians, and then they said, okay, so who else are we missing? And I'm like, uh, <laughs> sanitarians. I was the only one who came from a water quality background, and uh, which kind of surprised me. And when I looked at the courses available here, there were two courses at that point that were available in, that had anything to do with water. One was Kellogg Schwab's uh, uh, Food and Waterborne Diseases, and one was in the Humanitarian Assistance course. Um, and that led me into the world of humanitarian assistance. Thank you, Gilbert. <laughs> um, it really opened my eyes. I did do the Humanitarian Assistance Certificate. Uh, I learned a tremendous amount, and as has been repeated a number of times here, I let people know what I was interested in. Um, I happened to do a paper on Afghan refugees and vector control, and that got a dialogue opened with, with Gilbert talking about that. Um, but I wasn't sure at the end of the MPH what in the world I was going to do. How do I, with a young family, um, and interest in international health, how do you make that jump? 
And amazingly, um, an opportunity opened up, and I would again say, pick your partner well. <laughs> um, I took an opportunity to work in Afghanistan and led a WASH project there that was going to be a 10-month project. It became a two-year project, because <laughs> nothing goes easily in Afghanistan. Um, but it was a, it, my husband supported me, my kids supported me, it was possible. Yeah. And Gilbert was patient as I worked with my family schedule around that. But it, there are opportunities out there. Let people know what you're interested in. Let them know what your passion is. Um, there is an avenue out there. And then um, when I came back from there, again, keep in touch with your professors. There are opportunities that you just don't know. They're hidden around the corners. I had stayed in touch with, at that point, it was a Center for Refugee and Disaster Response, and with Kellogg, and um, kept knocking on doors and, and letting people know that I was around. Well, that led to working with Kellogg on a project that led to a PhD, much to my surprise. Um, I finished that just before I turned 50. So yes, older students, way to go, hang in there. <laughs> um, it's all, all doable. Um, and again, the, the doors that open up that are unexpected. It was in talking to a neighbor that I was interested in continuing in humanitarian work that that led to my resume being passed through a number of hands and landed in the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance, where it was really an informational interview that uh, led me to meet with my WASH colleague um, and learn what the possibilities were there. So for those who aren't aware of the Office of Disaster, uh, sorry, Office of U.S. Foreign Disaster Assistance, we are the lead office for uh, coordinating humanitarian response on behalf of the U.S. government. We have um, six regional offices around the world. At this point, about 600 employees. Um, some of those are full-time. Some of them are support relief group or surge. Uh, I am now leading a team of WASH, uh, health, pharmacists, and an infectious uh, disease and pandemics unit. So um, it has a lot of opportuni opportunities both for public health folks, but we also have uh, eight other sectors that we cover, including shelter. And I understand my colleague Chuck Setchell is going to come and talk tonight. He's very passionate as well, very dedicated to humanitarian response. And um, I've got to say it's an honor to work as in a time when government can be challenging to work in and there are all sorts of dynamics going on in the world. Uh, they are dedicated humanitarian workers who have all had a lot of experience in the field. Uh, and we work very closely with CDC, IMC, SAVE, IRC, and a host of other NGOs and UN agencies. So thank you for your time and happy to talk further. So can I ask all our speakers to take their places, uh, random order, um, yeah. and please, if you would, join me in thanking all of them uh, for their very excellent presentations. So the floor is open now for questions. I see one person already, but please, if you wouldn't mind, just uh, introduce yourself. Uh, by the way, I think I didn't. Uh, I'm Cortland Robinson. I'm associate professor here in international health, core faculty at Center for Humanitarian Health. Uh, and I may have some questions myself, but I'll leave it to the audience first. And then if you have a question either directed to a particular person, um, say so. And if not, if it's a more general panel, then I'll allow you guys to decide how you might want to uh, answer their, each in order or just take, one of you take, take that one on. So the floor is open for questions. Take it away. Thank you. I think just speak into it. It, it may not be. Uh, thank you for sharing your experiences. My question, my question is about uh, what do you think that the challenges that the challenges that you had because you are female in fields. Thank you. I'm happy to start. Is that, can you all hear that? I'm not sure. Yeah. 
Um, Technological challenge. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I actually think ultimately um, there appears to be a high hurdle. Um, I actually think it's been a tremendous advantage. When I worked in Afghanistan, I was allowed to go into corners of households that I couldn't have gotten to as a man. Um, so I could speak directly with women with a translator. Um, and I, when I first went, and I thought, oh my gosh, I'm an American woman, how many strikes against me am I going to have? Because of working in rural Warda and meeting with shuras and commanders and mullahs, and um, I had to explain all of this. And it, it, was, it was really okay. And apart from that, the women allowed me in. So I would actually say I had a great advantage um, being a woman. And um, other than that first day at my first job, wondering <laughs> how it was going to go when my boss said, you know, woman professional, I'm not really comfortable with this, uh, it's been fine. I mean, I think like women in most fields, um, there's an expectation that you have to prove yourself harder and more. Um, you have to be the first one there and the last one to stay in order to be taken seriously. And I think that's regardless of what your field is. I think that's um, a common perception that many women face in the workplace. And of course, um, you know, as somebody who's an advocate, um, particularly um, the conversation that's happening currently in our culture around sexual harassment, um, that is something, again, that uh, every woman faces um, or knows someone who faces. And so I think, again, those are not specific to public health necessarily, but um, to just the challenges of being a woman and, and having to prove yourself more um, in order to be taken seriously. Okay. Uh, hi, so I'm actually an undergraduate student, um, but seniors on the Homewood campus get to take classes here. Um, and I believe that working with these vulnerable populations is the direction I want to take, but do you have any advice like specific to someone who you know, hasn't had that much education and may not have that distinguishable of a skill set? Like, How would I get my foot in the door? because I plan on working before coming back to higher education. Um, uh, I mean, I, I'll reiterate something that I think a couple of us set up here, which is, uh, you know, if you can get overseas, take the opportunity and do it, no matter what the position is. Um, my experience overseas, and well, almost in every job I've had, is there's always more work to be done, so if you're willing to do it, um, you're, uh, responsibilities can grow exponentially. Um, I would also say, you know, to be flexible about what those initial job experiences are. Uh, you know, I um, have talked to a number of people who are frustrated because they feel that they've put a lot of time and effort into their education and therefore they're looking for a great job where they're responsible for an outbreak response unit and that probably won't happen. So being open um, to, to jobs, whether you believe that you're capable of more or not, I think is really important early on. I would just reiterate the language bit that was mentioned. That's definitely like the biggest mistake I've made in my life is not keeping a second or third language um, skill. So I don't know if you speak another language, but that can get you into positions that you might not necessarily have a lot of experience in. Um, so do it now before you're too old <laughs> <laughs> or too busy. <laughs> I would say, too, if you can um, find internships, I, I think one of the challenges in um, this country is so many internships are unpaid. And obviously, not everyone is um, able to take that on. Um, they have um, you know, expenses to pay. Um, and it's unfortunate that that's the case. Um, so um, having said that, I mean, that is a, a, a great trajectory to get your foot in the door. I think a lot of times, if you're applying for something and it's just what you have on paper and no one knows you don't have a connection there, and I'll say, n not a single one of my jobs have I gotten through a connection. Um, so it, it's possible, um, but it takes persistence, which I think someone had mentioned earlier. Um, but, you know, if you can do an internship in an organization, um, all of a sudden you're no longer a, just a name on a piece of paper, but somebody you've proven yourself to someone. And 
and you've also shown initiative and ambition. Um, for one thing, on my team in IRC, we do a great job of even our folks who are HQ based, who are working on grants or working on operations, if they want field experience, um, they've proven themselves and our team will find them a field placement and generally they don't ever come back. Um, so it's at the detriment of our team um, in the sense that we lose that, but we're building a pipeline of leaders. And so even if it's not a job um, that is ultimately where you want to be, like getting your foot in the door and then utilizing how you've proven yourself um, to take that job and make it something else, I think is really helpful. Uh, yeah, I would echo that very much. And it, it's really nice to look out in the audience and see Nicole who worked in our office, started as a receptionist, and I'm sorry to give away all the <laughs> story, but really I, I did exactly that and proved herself and, and worked incredibly hard and was very willing to take on whatever and got exposed to a lot of the work um, and the breadth of the work. Uh, and so getting in the door, seeing what different organizations are like and what the, the foundational work is, but being willing to kind of uh, do the grunt work um, to see that is is very helpful. And from there, kind of seeing what you respond to and what you like. And I definitely, uh, I think it's awesome that you want to get some exposure before you come back to school because then it can be, that's that was kind of what I did, I think a lot of us. Um, not that I ended up being very focused in my studies, but you have a drive and you have a goal and you can be a little bit more um, more specific with your time here. So. And I would just follow up again um, to say taking advantage of opportunities like this and networking opportunities, receptions. Um, when I was doing my MPH, I was a full-time student and working full-time and commuting from Washington. And um, so I missed a lot of opportunities like this. I took the train in every morning, I did my classes, I ran back and I worked from 2 to 10 p.m. every night and then studied you know, until the wee hours of the morning and did it again. And it's the one thing I really regret about my master's program that um, I really should have um, had really spent more time on campus to take advantage of so many, like Hopkins opens so many doors. You have so many incredible alumni who come in and do talks like this, um, cocktail receptions, um, you know, just asking people and talking to them, I think is really helpful to make sure that your name and face is continued to get out there. Uh, question over here. Um, thank you very much for coming. And through your talks, it's very clear that you have so much passion in this work. Um, and it, I've noticed from especially here being in Hopkins that there are a lot of people who are passionate about humanitarian work. But can you talk a little bit about at what points were you hesitant to take these um, opportunities and whether you overcame it and if you have any strategies in overcoming those? Okay. Thank you for that uh, question. Um, I do have to say that I got some pretty major pushback, uh, not from my family, not from my closest friends, but from people um, I was associated with when I chose to go to Afghanistan. And that was a big hurdle to have people saying, calling me out as a mom to go overseas into what was uh, a somewhat risky environment. Um, and I think it was such an incredible opportunity, um, and uh, the commitment, again, from my family really helped m to spur me on to do that. Um, but I think when you, when you are, there are risks and, and trade-offs in, in everything. I, I was telling people I could either be driving the Beltway every day, which I thought had tremendous risks in and of itself, <laughs> um, or I could be doing following a real passion and, and kind of seeing for myself what the world looked like out there and something I really wanted to do. Um, you find there is an, <laughs> an addiction being overseas in the field because people are so dedicated to what they're doing and really kind of driving forward. Um, but you do have to keep that life balance and, and figuring out uh, at what points in your life and where along the way 
the, the, the places and opportunities make best sense for you. And so again, that's where it leads to not necessarily a straight path and figuring out what the opportunities are at different points in your life that, that make the most sense. I'm not sure if that quite got to your question, but. Um. I'm gonna just take a different tack, which is um, to say that it's, you know, humanitarian work is not for everyone. And I also really respect people who realize that about themselves and, and move on to something else. Um, I remember when I was working in South Sudan, getting a call from a medical officer, and we did um, put, had a number of levels to our recruiting because we knew it was quite a difficult place to work. And this person had made it all the way through the levels, and he arrives in Lokachokia, the logistics base, and my phone rings, and he says, there's a war. <laughs> I said, yes, <laughs> um, and, and he said, but, but I'm not sure it's safe. And it, you know, that is an understandable concern. Um, he had it at the wrong time, um, in my opinion, and I just <laughs> use it as to <laughs> illustrate the fact that um, it's important to know your limits, and this sort of work is not for everyone, and field conditions are not for everyone, and that is okay, and there's plenty of other important work to do. So um, I would also just put it out there that um, if you, if it makes you extraordinarily uncomfortable or unhappy, um, it is really okay to move on too. And I would say from an advocacy perspective, um, I'm not somebody who's deployed. I don't, I don't work on our emergency teams. I don't oversee country programs. I'm always in Washington. I hardly ever travel. Um, but despite that, um, the advocacy environment and the policy environment in which we're living, particularly around refugee issues, is really challenging. Um, and so, um, you know, the policy environment in any context is tough now. Um, but when you add on to that refugee issues, when you add on to that um, sexual assault and sexual violence and gender-based violence um, and, and sort of the direction of the conversations in Washington around these issues, um, it, it, it can be really frustrating, particularly in the humanitarian sort of context in which we work. And, and so I, um, you know, I'm passionate about it, but it's also a, a source of hesitancy to kind of fight those battles day in and day out and sometimes not see any forward progress. Um, and, and one thing I'll mention, which is, goes back a little bit to the first question around challenges as females um, and, and the point that was just being made around safety and security. Um, you know, I had talked about sexual harassment um, and those conversations we're having, of course, within the, the humanitarian context, especially for women who are deployed overseas, this is a huge issue around safety and security. Um, and I would point folks to um, The Guardian has this great uh, piece called The Secret Aid Worker. Um, which I'm not sure what the frequency is, like weekly or monthly. Um, and there's a lot of aid workers, female aid workers, who are anonymously writing articles around their challenges in this field. And a lot of those challenges are related to sexual harassment or sexual assault in the field. And so would encourage folks um, to take a look at that. Um, and also sort of this idea of, um, you know, the white savior complex and sort of what that means and the divide between an expat um, sort of infrastructure and then the national staff and, and how that can be conflicting for folks um, when they're working in the field and seeing um, really strong, dedicated national staff who are doing excellent work being paid a fraction of what the international staff are doing. So there's a lot of really good conversations around those issues um, on the secret aid worker. Thank you. We'll try to get that posted up for the class and for the, those attending the webinar. Um, over here. Hi, uh, I'm Mirza Velajic, MSPH in International Health. Uh, my question will be for people who do not have a medical background, uh, what would be sort of your advice, what skills are really important and in demand right now? And especially as it pertains, my interest will be maybe in policy or policy research in that area. What would be sort of your advice? Thank you. So I can start. Um, so I forget who was mentioning it. Oh, you were, um, Melissa, about how you were the only sanitarian in your, your um, class. When I started at Hopkins, um, I think there were three attorneys, um, and the other two were going through the joint program. So I was the only one who had a, a JD by the time I came here. And I have to say, I found allies who I sat with every single day because about 
60% of the vocabulary, I did not understand what people were saying <laughs> because I didn't have a clinical background. And so I would be like, what, what does that word mean? And I, so I spent a lot of time, um, this, uh, this friend that I sat with every single day was a, an MD. So she, she kind of guided me through the process. <laughs> but it was a challenge. Um, and um, I think in terms of skills for a non-clinician, um, certainly a lot of what I do is communications. Um, it's um, collaboration and coordination. I think somebody had mentioned the importance of coordination. Um, and I had talked a little bit in my remarks about working in coalition. And so um, making sure every partner around the table has some um, mandate that they come from from their organization, whether it's a research mandate or it's um, a, a policy mandate or it's an activism mandate. Um, so I think collaboration, partnership, coordination, communication, those are the skills that I rely he most heavily on. Um, and I think one of the, um, the untold secrets of the legal world is um, that folks who go to law school typically, I can't speak for 100% of folks, but they come out being really effective communicators, know how to write and know how to orally um, argue cases and, and whatnot. So I think that's really helpful in, in um, sort of the policy advocacy lens is taking that message um, and those words that I don't understand and like breaking them down for a public audience who is not gonna know um, you know, particular diseases and, and names that, um, you know, talking about it in a way that is, is knowledgeable for folks and gives them enough information, I think is really helpful. I guess I'll just add, um, I mean, and, and really repeating some of it, but policy, communication, diplomacy. Um, when I interview um, individuals for CDC country director positions, they are often <coughs> clinicians and often excellent epidemiologists as well. And I often ask them about what they see as sort of the major priorities coming, you know, in the next three or four years. And almost every time what I get is sort of a, um, a summary of CDC's scientific priorities. And I'll hear about, well, what's the target for HIV and our target for malaria? But it's the people who actually say, well, you know, we really need to be thinking about the population boom in Africa and what is this going to mean, uh, not only for our programs, but for capacity to educate um, all of these young people who are suddenly going to come of age, the, the, you know, not only educate them, but provide health care and jobs. I mean, people who are really thinking sort of beyond the um, clinical aspects or the, the particular aspects of whatever their scientific interest is and can, and can think in a much um, wider, holistic way and communicate it, I think, is important and lacking, hard to find those people. Yeah, and I'll just follow that. Like, so on our, that emergency health unit team, initially the structure when it first started was the clinical lead who was a doctor, was kind of above the nurse. Um, and we had excellent clinical leads. I mean, people with CVs that were like 50 pages long. But it was really interesting on all the teams. It oftentimes was it's not necessarily the nurse, but people other than that highly specialized technical person that could manage the whole problem, like the whole program that had life skills, that was organized, that could prioritize, that could um, translate things in a way that a national staff member could understand. So don't, like, don't underestimate it, it just having life skills and being able to communicate and organize and prioritize. And I think that's why, that's what I try to tell the nurses that feel a little bit lost, like, oh, I'm not a doctor. Like, you don't need to be. Like, those skills are needed, but one person needs to have them, and then somebody else needs to be able to mon disseminate them and monitor them and, and communicate them to a much wider audience. So. I'll just add briefly to that. Um, the, off, the, the division within OFTA that's grown the most over the last few years is our policy team, the HPGE, Humanitarian Policy and Global Engagement, which is now, um, I don't know, over 100 people? I don't know. It's, it's gotten very large. And a lot of that is because we are linking much more closely with other US agencies who are involved in disaster response. Um, because we realize if we're not at the moment, um, we are all jumping over each other and stepping on each other's toes. So that there's a lot of work to not only understand the policy um, world, how do we link better? And that does take people who communicate well, who collaborate well, and who get the bigger picture. Um, yeah. Okay, I think we have time for one last question, so go right ahead. Great. Um, 
I'm honored that I get to be the last question. <laughs> um, so my name is Alana, and I'm an MPH student concentrating in health and humanitarian assistance. And I was just wondering if um, you got any of you have faced any ethical quandaries in the field mm. and how you dealt with them, <laughs> like what the interpersonal ramifications were. And I know that might be a long question for the last one, but thank you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, if you have an hour or two, we can begin to cover it. Um, yes, constantly, all the time. Um, and, and I, um, since I'm talking to Hopkins at large, I will put in a push for ethics courses at Hopkins that look beyond research ethics. Um, because in outbreak response and humanitarian emergency, there is no IRB, and most people might jump up and down that they don't have an IRB, but it also means that there is no guidance. You have uh, minimal data um, that's probably um, not even close to being right, and you need to make a decision in the next three hours, and there are serious consequences and lives at stake. And I think the ethical dilemmas are, are many and um, with no right answers. Um, so just a few that come to mind from the Ebola response, um, and I know some of you are here in the public health surveillance class, so you've heard a little bit about this from me before, or so I apologize, but um, in the Ebola response, you know, for example, we only have so many seats on the plane, and so when we were putting our teams together, what's the appropriate division between outbreak response and research? Because anybody who I put doing research, which would certainly you know, give us important information for the future would not be trying to stop change of transmission today. Um, and so what is the appropriate balance? And each country addressed that very differently. Liberia had very little research done, but we got to zero first, and perhaps that was part of the reason why, whereas other countries spent a lot more of an effort on research early on, which will help us um, and has already helped us in the future, but it took them much longer to get to zero. Um, so that's just one example of many. I, I think another one that's um, not the most politically correct, but I'll go ahead and, and say it anyways, is trying to balance um, capacity building, which for CDC and I think for most of the international response partners is a significant, if not the main part of our mission, um, with stopping trains of transmission. Um, there were times when I knew, and I, I know it's not um, always nice to say, but I knew that if the CDC team and others sort of stepped in and did some of the work, we might stop a transmission chain faster. Um, but we are also not in the lead, and um, we, our job there was to build the skills of the Ministry of Health. And that balance um, in a situation where uh, people are literally dying in the streets is, is really hard um, to think about and to figure out what the right thing to do is. So just two of many examples. I would say um, we, there are, are many instances when we get challenged, and you know, being a, a humanitarian organization within the U.S. government comes with its own challenges. Um, we do work under the authority when we're in country under the ambassador, um, and so we can't adhere to complete neutrality at any time. Um, but we do try as much as possible to keep needs-based, evidence-based as the primary push in anything we do, but it's really hard when the, the needs are unclear, when the timing isn't what it should be to actually address those needs. Um, I would say that's a, a daily concern. How do we get interventions um, out faster and then do the due diligence behind taxpayer money being spent? Um, and so the accountability to populations is foremost in our minds, but we know day after day we're not getting it there fast enough or enough. And so that, you know, that is a fundamental um, issue. Yeah. So I'll add a couple from the gender-based violence lens. Um, so one of the, the questions we often get asked um, when we're trying to get services in place for a particular context is give us, um, you know, show us the context, how many women are being, um, uh, are experiencing gender-based violence, et cetera, et cetera. So we're having to prove why we need to put services in the first place. Um, which is unethical from a gender-based violence perspective because if we don't, um, you know, people aren't going to come forward and report if there's no services to refer them to, right? And we can't ask them to do that. And this is a message that a lot of different donors have asked, and it's actually against guidelines and best practice in gender-based violence where you're supposed to assume 
that uh, violence against women and girls is happening and prioritize it from day one instead of waiting for this data to come forward. And so that's a message we're continually trying to, to advocate on behalf. I think the other one that's related to death, data and ethics is um, when we do have information management systems in place and we're um, collecting data for um, women and girls who come forward and, and um, knowing sort of the aggregate data and, and so that we can plan and advocate for if we need to make improvements in safety and security at particular water points or um, increase lighting to reduce violence. Um, you know, because that data is is shared with a, a coordination team, um, sometimes there's disputes over um, how that data gets shared. And again, from a survivor-centered per, uh, perspective, making sure that oh, um, anybody who's come forward knows how their data is going to be used and can um, uh, opt out of that um, every point along the way and making sure that we're making that very clear to folks. I think we're out of time. Um, before I thank the panelists, I want to thank all those in attendance, uh, whether again here physically in Sheldon or, or on the web for your excellent and really wide ranging questions. Um, but again, our really four excellent panelists, we've heard about persistence, we've heard about um, problem solving, uh, and we've heard about passion, and we've also heard about there's no straight pathway, redeem the time, whether you're doing domestic work, even though you're thinking about international um, how PTA skills help you with community uh, capacity building and engagement. Um, all of these uh, are really part of what makes for effective public health practice, uh, research, policy, um, and ultimately problem solving. So thank you again to all our panelists. Thank you for coming. <laughs>